Whenever I think about termination, I think about ping pong tables and large quantities of peanut butter. Mm. This little guy has very challenging jobs at the end of your SCSI chain. I think what she's trying to say here is that the Terminator does a nice job of catching the data at the end of the SCSI chain. Data that reaches the end of an unterminated SCSI chain resembles a ping pong ball reflecting back into the stream of data. Now you might think, what's the big deal? So there's an extra bit of data bouncing around in my SCSI chain. Well, that extra bit of data can bounce off of the other electronic data until, before long, the data signal can go haywire. If the SCSI chain is properly terminated, the electronic data signal comes roaring to the end, and whap, it hits. This is where the large quantity of peanut butter comes in. To demonstrate what really happens when data comes to the end of a terminated SCSI chain, my assistant will cover the opposite side of the ping pong table with nearly 100 pounds of extra chunky peanut butter. Now when the data comes to the end of a terminated SCSI chain, plop, it hits, then softly dissipates. Cool. So remember, termination is a good thing. It equals ping pong plus peanut butter. Yeah. RAID in the world of hard disks refers to a redundant array de independent disks. Basically, what this means is that data can be shared across a group of similar disk drives. To talk about RAID level zero, we need to talk about birthday cakes. Birthday cake? <laughs> an ordinary birthday party is a lot like an ordinary SCSI chain of non-arrayed hard drives where the birthday cakes would be stored on separate drives, like separate plates. That makes 2,189 cubic centimeters of moist, sweet, spongy data. Mmm, data. On non-arrayed birthday cakes, I mean hard drives, the cake or your data files have to come off of the drive one piece at a time, traveling only as fast as the SCSI bus is capable of moving. Now imagine you're at a RAID level zero birthday party, complete with a pair of FWB drives in a disk array. At this party, just like the other party, there are still two kinds of birthday cake, chocolate and vanilla. Lots of hungry assistants who want one piece of each. RAID level zero simply stores and accesses our information, or cake, more efficiently than on non-arrayed drives because the portions of each piece of cake can be simultaneously accessed off of both disks. Your data files are shared between two hard drives, opening up twice the bandwidth for transferring and accessing that data. In our case, half of each piece of the birthday cake would be stored on each of two drives. When everyone is ready to eat cake, the pieces join as they come out. With RAID level zero, each piece of cake is split into two segments coming out of two different hard disks in parallel, theoretically getting information to the computer twice as fast. So, here's the recap. A non-array mm. birthday cake delivery system is the equivalent of trying to suck cake through a straw. An array level zero birthday cake delivery is a bit faster. What does RAID stand for again? Redundant Array of Independent Disks. Precisely. And to describe RAID Level 1, which is also known as mirroring, we need to talk about broccoli. Mm. 
Ugh. Like RAID Level 0, RAID Level 1 writes data onto separate disks. But here's the difference. RAID Level 1 writes an exact copy of the data to a second drive, mirroring the file. So here's where the broccoli comes in. For this experiment, we've strapped one of our faithful assistants into a chair at the dinner table. Now, imagine your dinner is your data. In this case, your data is a bowl of broccoli. Now, if something unfortunate should happen to your data... <laughs> with RAID Level 1, you have a fresh backup copy of the data. Ew, yuck. So you're covered. You've got a mirror copy for a backup. Eat up. To achieve optimum performance on a hard drive, your files must be defragmented or contiguous. We're not getting it quite yet, huh? Okay. A hard disk is like a pizza. It's important that we understand that a disk is divided into sectors and tracks. When the computer writes files to a disk, it begins writing in the first available location. If your disk is fragmented, it has to skip around to find locations to write the data, taking much more time in the process. Conversely, when the computer tries to find that file later, it has to work much harder, skipping around to find the pieces that are scattered on your fragmented drive. This makes it slower than a clean, defragmented drive. Imagine your hard disk is highly fragmented when you write files to it. It would be like trying to put your favorite topping on any available space on the pizza. Now, try to eat a piece of pizza with only your favorite topping on it. It isn't easy, is it? Fragmentation makes access to data and pizza eating very slow. Guess what we need to do now? Order another pizza? No, silly. Defragment the one you already have. So get to it. Defragment that pizza and make it snappy. So, there you have it. Hard disk. Pizza. Pizza. Hard disk. <laughs> Is this on? Hi, I'm Tom Fristo, and I'm the... <clears throat> it all started when we discovered FWB's Tom Fristo 5,000 feet below the Earth's surface in a secret research and development lab. With a crew of 412 and the largest budget in multimedia history, things got stranger from there. I see this piece as a cross between when Harry met Sally and Planet of the Apes. Loosely based on a 4,900-page script, Emotion Studios and Sausalito lured in the country's best continuity people to bring the project home in a mere 40 months. Final characters sang opera, peeled off labels, got small, and had fetishes for heavy equipment. All told, nearly 100 terabytes of final elements were submitted before being chopped down to 18 megabytes. Even a wacky professor made it through the ringer, tormenting assistants in the process of explaining the intricacies of FWB's hardware. Without Macromedia's powerful tools and the mayor's hairstyling, none of this would have been possible. <laughs> <laughs>